I'm happy to have Daniel here today in this very uh, um, momentous time for Venezuela. Uh, I remember a year ago we had a discussion here at the ISS on the crisis in Venezuela. I remember we started by saying how uh, at that time it were, they, they were beginning to suffer from scarcity of products such as toilet paper and food staples. And I remember how we started the discussion pointing out how the scarcity of products reflected the deep economic problems of the country. Um, the foundations of Chavismo, uh, the revolutionary um, ideological uh, movement founded by Hugo Chavez, was put in doubt at that time, and as it is today, by skyrocketing inflation, deteriorating food security, spiraling criminal violence. And the fact that the Venezuelans still suffer from this lack of toilet paper, among other very basic products, shows, uh, um, um, provides a gloomy background for our talk here today. So uh, an increasingly large sector of Venezuelan society has come to challenge Chavismo, uh, and uh, the, 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 the continued rift, political rift in Venezuela uh, uh, makes us um, see more protests in the future, despite the violence having been reduced recently. So I'm happy to have here Daniel Lansberg Rodriguez, a prolific writer and analyst uh, uh, specializing on Venezuela. He's a fellow at the University of Chicago's Comparative Constitutions Project. He has written for va various publications such as The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Financial Times, among others, and is a weekly columnist for El Universal newspaper. Uh, Daniel was uh, telling me yesterday uh, his uh, nightmarish experience of trying to find coffee in Caracas, taking three days to, to find it. And I hope you enjoy your, your IISS Thank you. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, please, uh, thank you for coming, and the floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much, Antonio. I'd like to start off by uh, apologizing for having gotten here uh, several minutes late. Uh, my cabbie, who was a very nice gentleman from Colchester, uh, decided to take a shortcut through the mall, uh, and then up Strand, uh, which I think may have been the equivalent of what in Venezuela you call the Rockefeller discount for tourists. Uh, but I didn't realize at the time, and I ended up walking the last around 0 0.8, 0 0.9 miles very quickly, which may save me a trip to the gym later, but sadly could not <laughs> save you from having to wait around for me for 10 minutes, and I am very, very sorry for uh, that. Um, that being said, uh, it's, been, it's been wonderful uh, to be here, and I'd like to express sort of a particular appreciation to Antonio and the rest of the ISS team uh, for hosting this uh, event, because one thing I have learned, well, there were, I, I actually came to London initially a few days ago for the Chatham House Globalization Conference, and there were two very important lessons that I took away from that. One is that uh, Latin Americans, we like to assume that we're relevant everywhere. We're not. <laughs> uh, this, uh, this conference was, was, was excellent, but I was surprised at how little Latin America played into the equation. Uh, one, one would mention Brazil in the context of being the B in BRICS, and then go on to talk about Russia, India, and China. Uh, Venezuela came up once in a list of countries with estimated and estimates of their oil reserves, uh, but there was no talk of either the human rights issues, the censorship issues, the instability, and the fact that uh, Chatham House, uh, you know, had many excellent people coming uh, to the conference, and there was a wonderful discussion at the time. It was interesting how uh, small uh, a footprint we seem to leave as Latin Americans in various parts of Europe. Uh, that was a lesson that I came away from there. So the fact that uh, the uh, IISS is ha going through the trouble to host me uh, and to talk about these issues is something for which I'm very grateful. Uh, I'd just like to uh, basically start by saying that one of the reasons that it's understandable that Venezuela might not have much of a footprint on the national conversations in Britain is that coverage of Venezuela tends to be very difficult to muddle through. Venezuela is a big cup of crazy. Uh, and it's very difficult if you start from zero to comprehend a lot of the issues that are coming on. Uh, and part of that has to do with the fact that the country is a bit of an outlier in Latin America and always has been. Uh, it was never a viceroyalty. It was a general captaincy. It didn't really have much in the way of Spanish institutions because 
they didn't really find Venezuela that interesting. There was no giant native population that they could uh, subjugate. Uh, there was no real minerals at that time, which anybody found particularly interesting. Uh, it was a bit of a backwater. And you ended up having a situation where Venezuela has since then always been a bit counter-cyclical. Uh, in the 60s and 70s, when Latin America was very unstable, you had lots of coup d'etats in the 70s and 80s even. Uh, you had lots of dictatorships in Patagonia. You had... A, uh, governments in Ecuador or in Bolivia falling every few years uh, to coup d'etat. Venezuela had 35 years of very stable democracy. Uh, it was imperfect. Uh, it left a lot of people out of the democratic process, but at the same time, it was really the best uh, in the neighborhood vis-a-vis -vis stability. Uh, there were no uh, re armed revolts like you had in uh, neighboring Colombia. There was no military dictatorships as in Brazil. Uh, and that was something that is sort of particularly painful for Venezuelans to think of now uh, because people used to speak of something called Venezuelan exceptionalism, which was an academic idea from the 1970s and 1980s, which was basically, could the Venezuelan model be exported to countries, uh, the political model be exported to countries that did not have oil wealth? Uh, was it possible to recreate that model to grant stability to a lot of these other countries that were struggling? Uh, since that time, obviously, it's been Venezuela that's been trying to export its model, uh, and the model has not proven sustainable uh, in most situations, as I will uh, get to uh, a little bit later. Uh, so that fact that Venezuela tends to often be outside of the general current of what the conversation is for much of Latin America is, I think, one reason that it's difficult for people outside of that milieu to really comprehend a lot of the issues. The second part has to do with the messaging that the opposition uh, largely, uh, which is the group that, has, that writes, I think, the most for outside consumption, uh, the way that they tend to frame a lot of these issues. The government gives a very Panglossian view of how wonderful everything is and how utopian society has become. Uh, there is a lot of media censorship I write a column in a Venezuelan newspaper. Uh, it goes through various stages before I ever sees the light of day. Uh, first, it will be sent to my editor at the newspaper. That editor will recommend things that probably should be changed because it might be too dangerous. Uh, so there's a lot of self-censorship that goes on because newspapers are worried about getting closed down, about getting bought out, uh, about having uh, direct government interventions upon them. Set after that, once it comes out, there's a decision on whether it's going to come out on paper or whether it's only going to come out in online. <clears throat> the reason that newspapers in Venezuela are having to do this decision more and more is because uh, the government has cut off, uh, Venezuela has a controlled currency, uh, and it's very prohibitively expensive to buy something outside of control, of being able to access that controlled currency, which means you essentially have to have the government's permission to import anything, uh, or else you will be priced out of being able to do so. Uh, as a result of that, newspapers in Venezuela aren't given dollars to print, they're not given access to dollars, and legally they can't buy on the black market. So newspapers in Venezuela, which used to be about as thick as maybe the New York Times, then became about as thick as the Financial Times, and then from there on they've gotten smaller and smaller, uh, to the point that columnists now uh, will come out on paper maybe once uh, many columnists basically have to share very little space. Uh, so it's always sort of guesswork to see whether you're going to come out in, the, in one version or the other. Uh, so that's something that has happened more and more. And as a result of that, you have two very disparate conversations coming out of Venezuela. You have an official account, and then you have a lot of people usually blogging, <laughs> sometimes sending out messages and rumor by Twitter, uh, and a lot of that information tends to be wrong, uh, tends to be speculative even more often, uh, but also tends to have a very particular understanding of events. And it's something that I think started with the opposition and has since spread outwards. Uh, there's a series of assumptions, I think, that people who support the Bolivarian regime at this stage have to be one of three things. They have to be stupid, they have to be crazy, or they have to be incredibly cynical and opportunistic. There's That's a, an under, underlying assumption that many people in the opposition have of people who are supportive of the government. And that's something that spreads out in the media and that spreads out internationally and that creates these stories that are very simplistic and can be very confusing. Chavez was crazy. 
Maduro is stupid. Uh, Diosdado Cabello, who's the head of the National Assembly that many people are suspicious of, is deeply cynical and opportunistic. So you get into these tropes, essentially, that then destabilize the conversation outwards. And that's something that makes it very difficult to find enough common ground to really get a true appreciation as to the story. Uh, at the same time, it makes it very difficult for, and has made it very difficult for the, for the opposition to look inwards to see what the mistakes are that they are making. Uh, they tend to assume that it's luck when things go well for the government. Uh, and that's something that we're seeing very much now, uh, because the protests that destabilized Venezuela very, very dramatically for the last three months are now beginning to die down. Uh, the government was able to buy time due to the protests winding down, uh, or while the protests winded down, uh, in which there was a very present and very obvious disruptive effect by the opposition, which they were able to use to explain various problems that were going on in the macro economy of the country. Now, there's two theories as to why inflation has been as bad as it is, there's two, uh, as to why shortages have been as dramatic as they have been, uh, as to why the government's uh, control of the economy has been so, I wouldn't say unstable, but uh, prone to extremes. And one is that the government is essentially desperate that they are about to fall any day now, that they only made it out of this crisis as a result of Ukraine, drawing away attention from how bad things were in Venezuela, which is why the world didn't pay more attention. Uh, you, uh, Ukraine caused instability in Russia that made China give a lifeline to Venezuela after they had stopped lending uh, several months before. Uh, they seek externalities in which to explain why it is that things didn't work out their way. Uh, there were various moments in particular where it seemed like there might be uh, a deus ex machina that was going to change the, change the situation for the Venezuelan opposition very dramatically. One of which was the interview by Nicolas Maduro into, uh, to CNN with uh, Christy Amanpour. Uh, a lot of people assumed that he, that was going to go terribly for him. It was going to be so deeply embarrassing that he would not be able to continue to rule Venezuela, that there would be some sort of push from within, that there would be some sort of, uh, something would throw him off. He would be pushed out. And that didn't happen. The interview went fine. Uh, afterwards, in the OAS, when there was all these discussions about whether the uh, Organization of American States should make, take a statement and take a stand against Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro was a diplomat for many years. Uh, he has a lot of contacts, and many of the people who vote in the OAS have been receiving subsidies from Venezuela for years. Uh, logically speaking, the idea that the OAS would do anything but what they eventually did, which was give Venezuela a pass, was very clear if looked at objectively. But it's difficult to look at things objectively. And there are all these assumptions that Maduro is stupid and will mess up, uh, that the government is on the verge of collapse and has been for 10 years. Uh, there's very difficult times, I think, ahead for Venezuela. Uh, but I think that the economic situation that uh, Antonio was mentioning earlier is actually going to get more livable in the medium term. I don't think that the government is nearing collapse. Uh, I think financially it's been taking the last year to year and a half to stabilize a lot of the distortions that existed in the economy previously. And that has been a very painful and embarrassing process. It's caused tons of shortages. There are now four different pegs to the Venezuelan currency. Uh, or there's three different pegs and the, the black market rate. The black market rate is around 70-something. Uh, there is an official rate of 50. There is an official rate of 10. And there is an official rate of 6. Uh, and that means that, as you can imagine, the Venezuelan economy works a bit like a funhouse. Uh, there's a lot of government control over who gets to access which rate, which allows, obviously, for a lot of government control over business. Uh, that frustrates a lot of people. It makes people very reticent to uh, buy stock in Venezuelan companies or in projects that are active in Venezuela. But a lot of people are buying bonds right now. Venezuela recently went to the bond market and people assume that the coupon is very high, that Venezuela's government is probably not going to fall, is probably not going to default. 
so the government itself will maintain control, uh, I think, for the time being, even if the economy itself will become, I think, less dynamic than it has been. It will become less stable and it will become less dynamic. And it's a situation that we've actually seen in Cuba. The Cuban economy is not particularly unstable, uh, but it grows very, very slowly. And I think that that's where Venezuela's economy is essentially heading, uh, which is a little bit sad, uh, given that Venezuela, in the, up until the 1980s, grew for 20 years at 6% a year, and in the 70s grew faster than that. Uh, so it's going to be a, a very big change. But at the same time, those deus ex machinas that I think that the opposition placed a lot of stock in were tricky to consider. Uh, they were probably never going to happen. Uh, the reason being that when governments have fallen in Venezuela, it has very nearly always been as a result of a military coup. Uh, and military coup in Venezuela, uh, as are military coups in much of Latin America, tend to follow a very particular pattern. There are colonels and majors who are frustrated because the generals are the president's good friends. And as the generals are the president's good friends, they get to stay there however long they want and run things however they want. And then it's those lieutenants and those colonels and those majors who decide that they've had enough. And they overthrow the president almost as an afterthought to overthrowing the generals and becoming the generals themselves. That's how most military coups in Latin America have ended up happening, which is one of the reasons that after military coups, often the person who will be left as the president isn't actually one of the highest ranking members in the coup. They just tend to be the most dynamic one, uh, which was the case when Hugo Chavez, who was a uh, lieutenant commander, uh, was, the per was the person who spearheaded the failed coup in 1992. So now you can't really have that situation. Um, sorry, lieutenant colonel. Uh, you can't have that situation for the following reason. There has been so much money and so much time that has been spread out. Uh, Venezuela has gone through the biggest oil boom in the history of the world and come out of it with not very many national reserves. There have been colossal expenditures, and a lot of those expenditures are not well accounted for. When the army and the armed forces have benefited so much and so directly, it's not a matter that they might not have ambitions towards staging a coup or something along those lines at some point, but it doesn't make sense in a cost-benefit analysis. Uh, if you change a regime, the next regime is going to investigate what happened to that windfall. And if you feel that you might be implicated in something, even indirectly, if you exchange some dollars or receive some Argentine bonds and you're a little bit unsure as to how that's going to look after the fact, the downside risk of changing the status quo from a government that already gives you essentially all or anything you want and at the same time won't investigate you because it would mean investigating itself is very difficult to beat. There is nothing that the opposition can really offer that would be better than that deal. And as a result of that, even as things have continued to get bad, even as there has been more scarcity, even as there has been more instability, even as crime has gone through the roof, uh, there has been silence out of the barracks. And I don't know, think that that's necessarily due to ideological concerns. I think that that has to do with very pragmatic concerns, and I don't think it should have been surprising to the opposition. Uh, the opposition essentially exists, as does Chavismo, in my opinion, in essentially two strains. There are people who believe that the government can be dealt with, and there's people who believe that the government cannot be dealt with constitutionally. Uh, and that is the internal, the sort of heart of the internal conversation that's going on in the Venezuelan opposition and has been for some time. Uh, does there need to be a giant surprise event for Venezuela to change? Or is there a chance that the opposition could conceivably win an election? Is there a chance that they might conceivably convince the government to allow them a role in national institutions? That is at the heart of the conversation among the Venezuelan opposition, and it is a conversation that is becoming more and more polarized and more and more divisive. Uh, after the recent election of Nicolás Maduro out following Chávez's death, uh, there were moments in which the opposition cried foul, in which there were members of the opposition who said that the government had cheated somehow. Uh, and they negotiated with the government who promised that they were going to do an audit. Uh, there was a moment in which a lot of people expected the opposition leader, uh, Enrique Capriles, to 
stage a giant protest and to show the world what a big deal it was that the government had supposedly stolen the election. He backed down under this promise that there would be an audit, and the audit never really took place. And that lost the side of the, sort of the center wing of the opposition, which is uh, the La Mesa La Unidad, which is the major parties, essentially, within the, uh, uh, within the opposition. That lost them a lot of credibility among people who no longer think that the, that the government's promises can be trusted, who no longer think that there's anything that can change uh, within the constitutional framework because the process of uh, con- the government gaining control has already gone too far. As a result of that, what we've seen over the last several months was essentially a type of coup d'etat inside the opposition. You had a more conservative, uh, not necessarily ideologically conservative, but uh, people who did not believe that the constitutional parameters that are set in the way that they are enforced, which is that all institutions grow out of the government, would be able to work. And so you had these destabilizing protests. And these destabilizing protests were not handled well by the government initially. Uh, you had a sections of the country that were blacked out, uh, as in Táchira, San Cristóbal. You had a ton of tear gas being poured out every day. You had many people being hurt. You had accusations of torture. Uh, there was very, very, it was a very embarrassing moment for the Venezuelan regime, uh, which I think interestingly enough, handled it very differently than they have in the past. And what we've seen over the last few months is worse than anything we've seen in the last 10 years in Venezuela. Uh, but Nicolás Maduro wrote, or had written, an op-ed for the New York Times explaining his, his views and why it was all right what was going on in Venezuela and how there were destabilizing elements that any country would have acted the same way. Uh, Hugo Chávez would never have written an op-ed for the New York Times. Uh, Hugo Chávez never actually was so interested in explaining himself to the rest of the world. He would explain his ideology to the rest of the world. He would try to convince him. But there was never this idea that this is what's going on. Please stay out. It was far more pugnacious. And I think that there is an issue here which has to do with the Venezuelan regime or the Venezuelan system of government promising much, delivering less, and traditionally using charisma to fill that void. And that's something that Hugo Chavez did very well. Uh, he was able to explain away why things did not go the way the government said they would go. Uh, he was able to get people to continue liking him, even when crime was higher, even when 30% inflation was making them poorer every year. Maduro has had a harder time doing that. And I think that the interest in having the international community pay attention, from the government's perspective, had to do with that, which leads to the peace talks, uh, which I think most Venezuelans knew were never going to work. Uh, from the very first day of the supposed peace talks that happened uh, starting about a month ago, uh, it was clear that the two groups were not talking to each other. They were basically making pulpit announcements while surrounded by one another. Uh, their, the head of the National Assembly tweeted uh, something about uh, one of the members of the opposition being a murderer while he was at the table <laughs> uh, live on television uh, during these talks. It was very clear from the get-go that there was not going to be an accord. But it did by time. Uh, and in that time, a lot of the changes that had to be made to the macroeconomic structures in Venezuela to make the economy more viable were smoothed out. And a lot of the distortions were blamed on the opposition, who were suddenly incredibly visible, who were suddenly everywhere. You had students barricading off streets, mostly in middle-class areas. Uh, you had uh, opposition leaders taking to pulpits, traveling around the world, making statements in foreign newspapers. Uh, for people who are not necessarily very aware of the outside world in Chavismo's base, or who have traditionally not kept up with it as much, it was very clear that there was something going on and that there was something extraordinary going on. And if there were extraordinarily bad economy at that same time, that sort of made sense because there was a lot of chaos. And it was a way in which the government, which has been very, very successful historically in placing blame on something else, 
uh, in finding some sort of externality, uh, which, as I mentioned in it, uh, initially, the opposition has learned to do as well. So I think that what we have seen now is a big loss for this half of the opposition that has traditionally said, this is something that can be negotiated. This is something that can be worked out. Uh, I think that when a lot of the leaders, uh, who some of whom are incarcerated, uh, who weren't willing to negotiate, who didn't think that that would be productive, I think if and when they come out, uh, they're going to have a lot more credibility uh, than when they came in. I think that the government itself has very much dodged the bullet, essentially. Uh, and they've handled it very well. They haven't handled it like people who are crazy or stupid or excessively opportunistic. Uh, they've, their government has been very destructive to the country, but it has excelled at survival. And I th don't see uh, any reason now to think that that is going to change any time in the very immediate future. Uh, I don't know if you want to do questions? Or yes, yes. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Daniel. This is a, a very worrying scenario that you painted for Venezuela because on one side we have the uh, uh, the dying down of the protest movement, at least for now, but on the other hand, all the conditions are set for continuing stability, especially the opposition movement that is very divided and the, the radical wing still having influence, uh, the political rift not having been uh, bridged despite the peace talks mediated by Brazil, Colombia, by by, by the UNASUR umbrella and the, the economic situation uh, deteriorating and you said that uh, there, there, there is a perspective that it might become something like Cuba in which the, econom the economy is less dynamic uh, and I was just seeing in the newspaper today in El Universal actually that uh, uh, car production in Venezuela fell by 92% in May 92%. I mean, I, I follow news from, from Brazil a lot and uh, we used to uh, industrial production falling by 0.2%, 0.3%, and it's a massive deal and everybody complains, but 92%, I mean, the industrial base of Venezuela is very weakened, so it's a very uh, gloomy scenario indeed. So I wonder if uh, there are some questions from the audience? Uh, Let's start with you. I, I can take a round of questions. Let's start with you, sir. Thank C you. Can I just ask that you uh, please identify yourself? Yes, of course. Cho Kong from Shell. I'm Daniel. Uh, your analysis is most interesting, very much in line with my own understanding of Venezuela. Um, so you're, you see really the current regime carrying further ahead into the medium term, uh, putting in some measures to correct some of those economic distortions uh, that have built up in the, in the system. They're major distortions, we all know. Um, but essentially retaining a base of political support, which they, they've always managed to do. Um, my question is, two questions rather, one is that could you expand on the drivers that are pushing them in this direction? I think I know what they are, but you would sort of reply to them. And secondly, could you also expand on what it means for the energy sector, for the oil sector? Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, I'd be happy to. My take on that, uh, and again, when you're discussing any such uh, scenario involving Venezuela, it has to be kept in mind that the Venezuelan government is very good at keeping its secrets. <laughs> Uh, and I think a lot of OPEC countries are very good at keeping secrets, but uh, Venezuela in particular, the information coming out, uh, especially financial information, information on how much oil is being exported, especially given that much of that is exported through Petrocaribe and never actually goes to market, is uh, not necessarily the most reliable. So uh, sort of as an initial caveat, uh, these are my own opinions based on my own understanding, and I could be completely off base. That said, uh, I used to think that the Venezuelan economy was reasonably close to collapse, uh, just because my own work in, in economics and finance made me think that it had to be. It didn't make any sense that it wouldn't be. Yes, oil was high, uh, but there's all these expenditures, and there's all this money that's being given away to smaller countries in the, in the neighborhood, and that doesn't give much. Uh, they've been giving billions and billions of dollars every year to Cuba, and in return they get doctors, many of whom are undertrained, and lots of whom use the fact that suddenly they're in a country with open borders to run off to Miami. So at that point, it, 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 it didn't seem possible that the economy could be in a viable state. And this went up until about two months ago. And what changed my opinion on that was SICAD 2. Uh, 
Sikad 2 is the third rung of the currency uh, ladder, which I explained earlier on. And basically, it is 10 times what the other official rate was. I had assumed when Sikad 2 came out that it was going to be a way to make a quick buck. The government has all these dollars that come in from oil. They've been selling them at 10, which is the most expensive official rate that they can get for domestic expenditures. With the new rate, they could potentially sell it for 50. And once they do that, they can cover much more in the way of domestic expenditures, even if it's going to hurt inflation much in the short to medium term. That is what I had expected, and that is not at all what occurred. Venezuela went to the bond market instead. And that was something that I found very surprising. Uh, given all of the instability, given the fact that the media was making a lot, paying a lot of attention to that instability, it was clear that by going to the bond market, they were going to be paying very heavy coupon rates, and that that was something that was going to be avoidable if they just sold Sakad dollars, uh, Sakad two dollars, uh, or oil dollars at Sakad two prices, uh, even if that would be a terrible idea in the short term. But they didn't do that. They've been using Sakad two the way essentially they announced they would be using Sakad two, which is as a stabilizer of the economy, essentially. <clears throat> They, it enables them to devalue by industry instead of devaluing all at once. So essentially, uh, about two weeks ago, we had a situation where airline travel to Venezuela became five times more expensive when the Sakad, or from Venezuela, became five times more expensive when the Sakad rate was changed to the Sakad 2 rate from 10 to 50 uh, on the official rate. Uh, obviously, air travel is something that primarily affects the middle class. People who are or much of Chavismo's base can't afford to travel, and much in the way of Chavismo's most favored supporters can travel on private jets. So the fact that uh, the price on a trip to buy on American Airlines, uh, especially given the fact that the airlines have been pulling out of Venezuela for some time, uh, is was something that wasn't going to affect the party's base. And the opposition right now is too chaotic to really, you know, that's the least of their problems. So I think that it's enabled the government to be very strategic and almost take a scalpel to devaluation instead of doing it all at once and to not call it devaluation, which psychologically I think is something that's very important. Uh, so in that sense, I foresee that that is, I mean, SICAD 2 is why I think the economy is actually going to be stable in the medium term. And uh, your second question, which was about the oil sector. Uh, I think in the long term, Venezuela might have a bit of a hard road ahead. Uh, oil-wise. Uh, in part, that has to do with, obviously, the United States and the shale revolution and the fact that uh, the United States may need to import less. Uh, Venezuela has been, for a while now, exporting less oil to the United States, or preparing to, at least. Uh, they made a deal with China several years ago in which they were going to start exporting more oil to China. And it was... An interesting deal, because historically Venezuelan heavy crude, is, there's a lot of it, but it's not very easy to process. Uh, you need very specialized refineries. And I believe uh, you at uh, Dutch Shell uh, for a long time had a large refinery on Corsao that uh, was basically the way that Venezuelan petrol would go into the market through Dutch Shell. Uh, at the same time, you had a couple of refineries on the Venezuelan coast, and you had several refineries in Houston and several refineries in Canada. Uh, those refineries were what could process Venezuelan oil, or at least most of it. So Venezuela was, in a sense, very limited into who they could export to, because refitting refineries to be able to process this crude was going to be an expensive process. They negotiated with China so that some refineries would be refit to be able to process this crude. Uh, and obviously that was something that was expensive uh, for Venezuela, uh, but which may buy them time. I don't think that the rise of shale is going to hurt Venezuela all at once, at least. At the same time, there are problems with exporting to China, and that's largely logistical. Venezuela does not have a Pacific coast. Uh, Colombia is not about to lend Venezuela its Pacific coast. Uh, there is a situation in which now, to get oil from Venezuela to the refinery, you are going to have to go around one of the capes or pay the Panama Canal toll. And that's something that obviously is going to hurt each individual barrel of oil's value. So I think that it's going to become a little bit less lucrative and as for Venezuela. But I think that that oil is still going to be out there and it's still going to be accessible, particularly to China. 
there is also a sense which I find very interesting in which much of Venezuela's international credibility, uh, at least among its neighbors, has had to do with uh, these subsidized oil deals uh, that have been going on through Pedro Caribe and through the ALBA, which is the free trade bloc that was founded by uh, Hugo Chavez and uh, Fidel Castro uh, in, I believe, 2006. Uh, there is concern among many of countries of the countries that there is going to be less Venezuelan largesse, which might affect their own economic situation. As a result of that, uh, and a lot of attention has actually been paid to Cuba, which is by far the most, would theoretically have the most reason to worry because it's the most dependent by, by far on Venezuelan support. But at the same time, it's go, my view is that it would go, it's going to be a totem. Venezuela is not going to cut equally from every country. And if the expenditures start getting tighter, if they start focusing more on the domestic angle, which I think they will, because Chavismo has had for a long time a strain which is more a standard Latin American populist movement, which wants to give a lot of money to the local oligarchy, to the military, and to have a lot of expenditure at home to drive up a populist base. And another wing that is more internationalist, that wants to turn Venezuela into the spearhead of an international movement through oil diplomacy. And that's obviously very expensive. And it can be a hard sell when there's a lot of problems at home to be giving money away to countries like Argentina, which have a higher GDP per capita than does, than does Venezuela. So I think that there's a sense in which that is going to become less than norm. I think Venezuela is going to become less of a regional player and is going to turn inwards because I think that's the only way that the regime can continue to survive as it has. That said, I don't think that that'll affect Cuba anytime soon. I think that the Cuban relationship and with the Venezuelan government, which involves Cuban advisors being in the military, and Cuban advisors being in the security forces, uh, the oil for doctors program, which feeds the, uh, the some of the misiones, which are very popular even now, uh, that's not going to go anywhere, I think, anytime soon. Uh, I think that by having Nicolas Maduro have succeeded Chavez, uh, that was one of the things that was certain that Venezuela will not abandon Cuba uh, as long as it can. Even now, uh, they continue to subsidize Cuba while they're indebting themselves more and more to China. Uh, so in a sense, that relationship I don't think is going to go anywhere anytime soon. What is interesting, however, which was returning to your point on uh, the oil industry, is that a lot of the other countries, Bolivia, Ecuador, uh, St. Kitts, <laughs> Trin uh, I guess not Trinidad, uh, St. Kitts, uh, Nicaragua, are now having to turn outwards because they do have a reason to be worried. Uh, Venezuela, if it starts making expenditures on interna uh, an international largest, which may not be anytime soon. They just made a large investment in Bolivia, uh, I believe three weeks ago. But at the same time, if they do s take the pedal off the accelerator a little bit, those countries are going to have a tough decision to make. And that decision might be, do we try and make ourselves more market friendly? And in a sense, they, a lot of them have already been doing that. Bolivia and Ecuador are not, I mean, they are pretty market friendly. Uh, they do a lot of, I mean, rhetorically, they've been very in line with Venezuela, but they have very clearly avoided making a lot of the same economic policies, which have turned out to be a little bit short-sighted. I mean, Ecuador is on the dollar. Uh, there's, a, to an extent, a lot of the ALBA allies were always in it more rhetorically than economically or in copying those policies. And I think that that's something that is going to make it so that countries like China and Iran is now becoming more and more of a player among a lot of these smaller uh, Latin American countries. I think that those are going to be more and more important. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of uh, new oil exploration, new mineral exploration that's going to be happening in a lot of these countries independently of Venezuela. Please, sir. Um, Alan Gilbert, University College, um, London. Um, <clears throat> you sort of praised Venezuelan democracy after 1958 compared to what was going on elsewhere, and I understand the argument. But. But. <laughs> I've, um, I used to know Venezuela very well in the mm. 70s and 80s, and regarded it as a giant soup kitchen financed by oil, um, which financed corruption on a large scale, which um, financed a polarization of politics between COPE and Acción Democrática. This was maintained, stability was maintained because they took turns. Um, each one lost at the balance, the other one took over and everybody crossed their arms. 
and everybody in Venezuela was incredibly tolerant of the inefficiency, the lack of proper taxation, the fact that you imported everything. In my opinion, Venezuela up to um, Caldera and even worse then was a bit of a disaster. Under Chavez, you could argue that Venezuela continues to have a chaotic, corrupt, polarized government. Polarized in a different way because it's now polarized in terms of class. Instead of being divided between Cope and uh, Adeco, which was multi class, it's working class. Now, what I don't understand if until Chavez, the two major parties took turns, and that was what maintained stability. What has maintained stability after Chavez when there is no real chance of a turnover of government? And what you haven't said much about is how has Chavez and now Maduro, in the light of high inflation, rising crime, all the things that are supposed to cause real problems for government, what have they done right to maintain <coughs> perhaps 50, 60% of the population in their support? You said, and the answer to the last question, you mentioned the Misiones. But I mean, they must have done something right. Have they just redistributed the soup kitchen or changed the nature of the soup kitchen so that you're always going to the poor and that's causing the trouble with the opposition? But would you say more about. Absolutely. What? It's, a, it's a really excellent and really important question. There's obviously. Uh, I did not mean to say initially that Venezuelan democracy had been utopian by any stretch of the imagination up until the election of Hugo Chavez. I was saying that it was the best of what was around in a really bad neighborhood. Uh, that being said, uh, there were elements of the Venezuelan democracy which were class-based even then. Uh, ADE, uh, or Acción Democrática, had much more of a lower class uh, root on it, and it was very distributive. Uh, whereas Cope, uh, for most of that period, and they started, and as they traded off, they started looking like one another more and more, even if there, there was that polarization, which had a lot to do with identity politics more than anything else. And I think that in that sense, uh, what we have now is a successor of that system, because politics is still less ideological than it has to do with how you characterize your own self as a person. It has to do with identity. Once you become a Chavista or an anti-Chavista, there is very little new information that is ever going to change your mind. It's, la it's a bit like who your World Cup team is. Uh, and since Venezuela never makes it into the World Cup, uh, and it's the only South American country to never do so, uh, people have, a, it's a big part of your identity to decide which country you are going to go for and find some spurious path to make that victory your own. Uh, and that's something that I think has continued with, you know, with politics, uh, very strongly. The Venezuelan government has done very many things better, with the caveat that when Chavez was elected, every barrel of oil netted Venezuela $18, minus the discount for it being heavy crude, and often minus transportation costs. And that for much of the period since then, oil has averaged between $75 and $80, and since the situation has gotten really bad vis-a-vis -vis crime, vis-a-vis uh, -vis inflation, which really wasn't until around 2006, 2007, uh, inflation was a problem, but it was more, uh, it was easier to hide. It was a little bit slower, and they took three zeros off the currency, which fooled everyone for at least a good six months. But at that same time, you had a lot of 95 to 100, 110, 120 dollars per barrel oil. So if we look at the question of what did the government do right, there is a lot that the government managed to do right during that time uh, that, the, that the earlier governments had not been able to do. But I think there is also the question of what would a different government have done with 10 times the money. <laughs> and I think that one of the big changes has been that Venezuela has become a country which is in a current state of re-election. The 1999 constitution made it so that essentially every year there will be one major election or another. And when politicians are worried about an election, 
they will often make short-sighted choices to make sure that they win that election. And in many countries, that's something that you only have to deal with once every several years. In this case, it's something that's constant. So you mentioned uh, Calderas, and Calderas, at least in his first term, uh, and even more so Carlos Andrés in his first term, they invested heavily in infrastructure. Pérez Jiménez, the last dictator, invested did very heavily in the infrastructure. They built the highways, they tunneled through the mountains, uh, they created new roadways, they created aqueducts, they created viaducts, they made it so that Venezuela could use hydroelectric power so it could export all its oil. These are very wise choices to make economically, but they're not, or they can be, but they're not necessarily the most visible. Chavez has used much of these windfall to build stadiums uh, and name them after local politicians who he wants to curry favor with. Uh, he's uh, basically spent a lot of this money uh, trying to find ways to control the conversation, to create new media outlets that only tell the government side of the story, to absorb old media outlets that might not be telling the government side of the story. There's been a lot of expenditures that have been very good for survival, if from the government's perspective, but are not good long-term investments in Venezuela. Uh, the few that have been made, uh, I would say, would be the Senyat. The new taxation services are far and away better and more efficient. Uh, but I would argue that they're equally corrupt. Uh, and now that they're, and even though they're equally corrupt and more efficient, which would be a net gain, uh, they're also more politicized. There's a targeting of companies or of industries that are seen as not being supportive. So they become a form of control that I don't think the previous taxation authorities that essentially did nothing uh, were doing. So in a sense, I think that there's some of what you say is, is, is obvious, that there is a, you know, there have always been problems in Venezuela and Chavez has survived, and Maduro, or Chavez did survive, Maduro does survive. Uh, and I think it's because they've managed to control that conversation. Chavez was incredibly savvy at making the conversation about something else. Uh, there's one story that I, that I remember very, very clearly. Uh, during the, I believe it was 2005, uh, there was a push by the Venezuelan government to shut down Jesuit schools uh, briefly and then change their curriculum into one that was more in line with the government's ideology. Uh, the Catholic Church is one of the few institutions in Venezuela that still has not been discredited entirely and that exists internationally. Uh, so the Jesuits were a group that many Latin American countries, even in their worst, most dictatorial moments, have tried not to offend too much. Uh, because the Catholic Church in countries that are heavily Catholic has a lot of influence. Uh, when it was announced that this curriculum would be changed uh, was done during game, I believe, four of the 2005 World Series. Uh, and, and the reason, or one of the reasons Venezuela never makes the World Cup is because it's very heavily a baseball country. And in this particular World Series, Oswaldo Guillen, who is Venezuelan and who is the first Major League Baseball manager to be Latin at all, uh, was one of the coaches for the team that was about to win. Uh, and on state TV, there was a cadena, uh, which is when the government goes into basically... Uh, takes control of every television station because the president wants to talk, that interrupted that briefly. Uh, and the conversation the next day was over the World Series having been interrupted. Uh, and how dare they, that's, that's crazy. Uh, the conversation never actually got around to the changes in the curriculum for the Jesuit schools, even though the Jesuits, in their defense, made a very good play towards trying to make it about that. Uh, the conversation became about something else. And, and insofar as the government has never interrupted the World Series since then that I know of, uh, you know, the people got what it, they felt they wanted the next day, and the government got what it wanted. So I think that there's a way in which they've managed to control the conversation. In part, that had to do with uh, Chavez's own talent and his own savvy in being able to do so. Uh, and since then, it's had to do more and more with the fact that institutions uh, are very, very, very in line with the government and have to be. And that, I would say, is the biggest difference between pre-1998 and now. Uh, that you do not have an independent media, that you do not have pluralism of any kind, uh, that it is essentially impossible for the regime to, I mean, barring 
So when the first Venezuelan Republic fell, uh, which was back in the 18, early 1800s, uh, it was Bolivar had just taken over Caracas, essentially, and soon after there was a giant earthquake that leveled the city. And the Catholic Church, which was very in line with Spain, told Bolivar and his supporters, look, this is what happens when you turn your back on your king. This is what happens when you turn your back on Spain. This is what happens when you turn your back on God. And the people kicked Bolivar out. And that was the end of the First Republic. Short of some giant fifth deviation event like that, there is really no way that the government can be caught off guard uh, the way they were in 2000, and, uh, in, in 2002, the, the coup uh, against Chavez initially. And I think that they've worked very hard to make it that way. Uh, when, if the negotiations had been real uh, and not just a time-buying uh, a time buying device. That's what I think the opposition should have asked for. Uh, they were, they should have asked for a chance to be appointed, have some of their people appointed onto the uh, the to the Supreme Court or uh, into the electoral authority. That's those are the sort of very short term things that the opposition has to be pushing for. But that's hard to sell to the people who support you. Uh, people want political prisoners free. People want free media. Uh, and even if that were to take place, it wouldn't change the fact that constitutional institutions are so in line with the government that you can't have any surprises. And I think that that's the system being different. That's the system functioning the way they want it to. I'm 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 aware of the time. I'm just going to uh, think. Uh, I'm going to take a round of questions. Okay, to great. Give opportunity for more people to speak, please. Sir. Uh, Daniel, I'm, I'm Juan Carlos Bejarano from NTN 24, which is a, a Colombian TV channel that just got censored uh, by the Venezuelan I remember. government uh, for giving a voice to the opposition, basically. And to Moises. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, but my question has to has to do with, with what is happening in Colombia next week. We have the elections, mm -hmm. presidential elections. Um, uh, from my point of view, uh, there is a, a strong possibility that the candidate of uh, former President Uribe, Oscar Iván Zuluaga, uh, will win the election. And uh, for those of you who don't know uh, Mr. Uribe, well, he uh, was a rival of Chavez, and he more or less hates uh, the Chavismo. There's no more or less. <laughs> <laughs> Just more. Uh, I know that when uh, uh, President Santos uh, became elected four years ago, uh, some of my contacts in the Venezuelan government told me they were preparing for a conflict with Colombia. Uh, <laughs> this is four years ago. Things are stronger now. What do you think will happen if Oscar Iván Zuluaga uh, actually wins? Obviously, uh, I see Again, the, the Colombia and Venezuela splitting and maybe forming two groups uh, of countries in South America, taking into account that uh, President Maduro has more or less every South American country on his side, apart from Panama, and, and the current, Peru, president Chile. Is, current president is going. And former president of Chile is gone, so yeah. all his rivals are going, basically. <laughs> uh, this is the last chance if you have another question. Uh, John Seidel, and another sort of regional question. I guess from what you describe, in almost every way uh, that materially matters to people, since the first uh, public uh, sort of love affair between Chavez and, and, and Fidel, um, Venezuela has, has become more like Cuba in terms of people's day-to-day -day experience, with the one huge exception of the crime situation. And I wonder if you can sort of comment on that. That's a great that. question, yeah. Yeah, Chair Johnson, the assistant. Just my question would be: if you just comment a little on uh, Venezuela's external defense and security posture to its neighbors and in, in the region, and I think that ties in particularly with, uh, with, with the Colombian linkages and perhaps uh, Venezuela supporting Nicaragua in various disputes it has with uh, Colombia. Any last question? Uh, Bryce Campbell, the fellow at the in Washington. There was some debate. Uh, about the U.S. Uh, imposing sanctions to try and affect the outcome of the peace talks. Just wanted to get comment on that and whether that ship has sailed uh, in terms of U.S. influence. Just to uh, tell you that we don't have a huge amount of time. Okay, I will try and be yeah. brief. It's not come naturally, <laughs> as you see. But, just uh, a few questions. <laughs> okay, uh, so 
here we go. Uh, I'm going to actually start with, uh, well, let's do it. I'll just do it logistically. Okay, so your question about, uh, about Suluaga and the, and the Colombian uh, elections. I would start by saying that the fact that Uribe continues to be so influential in Colombia as a former president is actually part of the struggle that Venezuela is having. Venezuela does not have any former presidents. They have two caretaker presidents who were never elected, and everyone else is dead. And in Latin America and in the United States and in many countries, former presidents do not get politicized. They do not opine publicly about what current presidents are doing because they didn't have it done to them. And it's sort of a cycle and it's considered to be a little bit gauche to do so. And, you know, that cycle sometimes broken, but it's rarely broken. In Latin America, that is not the case. Ex-presidents are very much alive. And sometimes they can be a blessing for the government, as Lula has been to Dilma. And sometimes they can be a curse, as Uribe has been to Santos. And I think that what you have there is a situation in which Santos and Uribe's relationship is partially informed by the fact that Santos had been Uribe's candidate. And that went 180 degrees from what Uribe himself had done. And I think that that's something that makes it almost personal uh, between the two. I'm pretty sure that Uribe would have very carefully, therefore, vetted the next guy. (laughs) Uh, that he was going to support in trying to take control. So do I think that a new Colombia under uh, Zulaga would be more Uribeita? Absolutely. Uh, do I think that that would make a big difference in Venezuela? Maybe. But one of the things the government has done well is to make it so that, play, let's say, mouthpieces that are predictably going to be hostile are not taken very seriously, which feeds to your conversation about the United States. If Brazil were to have said something against what the regime in Venezuela was doing, that would have that would have sent shockwaves. But if the United States does it, well, see, it's 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 the gringos sabotaging us again. What have we been telling you this whole time? And in that sense, the sanctions are a little bit counterproductive. And we had this issue recently in which a lot of people in the opposition were telling uh, uh, Miss, Miss Jacobson uh, about that fact that having the U.S. help is not something that helps the domestic situation at all at this stage, which is sad, uh, because the United States and Venezuela had a very productive relationship for very, very many years, and the United States has been absorbing a great deal of the uh, Venezuelan professional exodus, uh, and soon those people are going to start voting, and they might turn into another Miami-esque type Cuban voting bloc. Uh, uh, there's a lot of interesting reasons why the two countries could be aligned in that respect, but having statements or sanctions from the United States is not going to help. During the Libya uh, investigation, I believe in 2011, uh, there were some very small sanctions placed on Venezuela, uh, which were kind of symbolic because they placed the sanctions on Pedevesa but not on Sitco. So essentially, there was nothing that Pedevesa could no longer do in the United States that they hadn't already been doing through Sitco when they got sanctioned. But the fact that the word sanction in the United States could then be come out in Venezuelan press, as you see, uh, that was something that, you know, made, gave some validity to the government when a lot of their other claims, like that the United States it injected Hugo Chavez somehow with cancer, or that they use earthquake rays to level Port-au-Prince, uh, that are a little bit less believable, uh, but that are still made by the government become a little bit more believable when the other things that the government's telling you, like we're about to be sanctioned by the United States because they want to bring the people's government down, uh, do come to light and then are verified in international press. So I think in that sense, the sanctions, even though they're only against officials and not against the companies and are more likely to affect the economy of Miami, which will sell far less Lacoste shirts and far less real estate in Brickelkey to Chavista uh, officials, uh, is then it's going to be, uh, affect the Venezuelan economy. That's not the way it's going to be digested internally. 
Uh, and that's, I think, the problem. Uh, and it's this disconnect between dialogue and reality that I think is going to make it so that Colombia becoming more anti-Venezuelan isn't really going to matter. The economies are just too intertwined uh, between the sister republics for that to be the case. Uh, during the war between uh, Uribe and Chavez, when Chavez, um, almost on a whim apparently, sent tanks to the Colombian border, uh, there was a lot of talk as to the security situation. Uh, between Venezuela and Colombia, which uh, uh, steps to your point as well. At the time, I was uh, at the at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, and there was a simulation that was done between uh, what a war with Colombia and Venezuela would actually look like. And if I recall correctly, the takeaway was that Colombia would steamroll Venezuela. Uh, they have twice the population. They have been in a low-level state of war for generations. Uh, Venezuela last had a war against a neighbor at its independence, uh, and it's and you know it's not it has a lot of bellicose rhetoric. It doesn't tend to actually go to war, and the military is not particularly well trained. The one caveat I would say in saying that is that Venezuela did have certain advantages over Colombia some of which were a little bit silly. Venezuela bought a submarine from Russia back when Putin and Chavez were looking for something to talk about initially because Chavez wanted a new friend and there wasn't much to talk about since they both had oil, so they ended up buying a lot of weapons, uh, a lot of AK-47s a lot, uh, and that submarine. And then I think Putin gave him a small dog, a uh, little black dog, I believe he named a uh, Russian. Uh, which was a very good name for a little dog given to you by Putin. Uh, and those wouldn't make much of a difference. But the other thing Chavez bought from Russia were, was an Air Force. And the Venezuelan Air Force is much stronger than the Colombian Air Force. The Colombian Air Force tends to be the types of things you need to fight in the jungle, unsurprisingly. There's a lot of helicopters, uh, but there aren't very many planes that could sweep in and destroy a military base. Uh, what Uribe did to balance out that equation, which I think was actually very tactically intelligent, was that he invited a lot of American advisors to come to Colombian bases. Uh, so at that point, if Chavez uses his Air Force to attack a Colombian base and an American military advisor is killed or hurt, it's no longer really a conflict between Venezuela and Colombia only. Uh, and I think that that was one way in which Uribe very wisely balanced out that equation of the one advantage that Venezuela would have had. Uh, I don't think a war was ever a possibility. Both sides knew that. Uh, it was a rhetorical war. And it was strange to see that in Colombia. Uh, Venezuela has a system where the, the rhetoric and the propaganda does not usually match reality, and people are used to that. Uh, Colombia, less so. So I think that there was, a, there was a lot of surprise internationally, and there was a lot of surprise in Colombia. People in Venezuela were just essentially joking that, oh, they're going to go to the border and they're going to sneak across and they're going to buy black beans and chicken and all the things you can't buy here and they're going to send them home to grandmother. Uh, that, that was what, that's why the tanks were there. So insofar as the security situation is concerned, they're not necessarily, I mean, there are no neighbors that Venezuela, I think, could realistically ever go to war with. Uh, they might finance people who go to war against uh, certain segments of, of their own population on occasion, uh, but Venezuela hasn't had a war since independence, and I don't see that changing. Uh, that's not true. They had a civil war, but they haven't had a, a war against a neighbor since independence, and I don't see that changing. Um, there was one more question. Uh, Regarding crime. Crime, yes. Okay, so this is one that I saved the best for last because I'm, I'm particularly fond of this because my, my wife and I actually met during the kidnapping. So it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I've written about it before and it's basically sort of the, uh, the Venezuelan take on the how I met your mother story and I'm someday excited to kind of, you know, sit around, you know, with my, with my brood and tell them that, you know, when I first met your mother, uh, she was gagged. And, um, so there's essentially a situation in which in Venezuela people have become very used to crime. People are, I mean, when, I live in Chicago now uh, when people visit me from Venezuela. And Chicago is not a particularly safe city by American standards, but the idea that you can be outside at night and not behind the walls of a beach club or not in a courtyard is completely foreign at this point, uh, especially in, in Caracas. Uh, 
And it's not just the lower class areas that suffer from this. Uh, it's the upper class areas and the middle class areas which are then targeted for kidnappings, uh, for assaults. Uh, even during the day, uh, this sort of thing happens. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. Uh, when I was... Uh, very quick story. Very quick story. <laughs> Sorry, I started 15 minutes late, though. Um, so basically, I uh, worked on a television program called uh, Civilization. It was Channel 4. Uh, it was a documentary with Neil Ferguson. Uh, that filmed in Venezuela. And uh, Ferguson had been, uh, he's, he's a good friend and he was a professor of mine in graduate school and I came in as the person who was going to help make all of the filming permits, etc. and explain how Venezuela worked, that sort of thing. Uh, while we were there, on the very first day, uh, we were in front of a metro station. Uh, they had just the, the, the team had just come in on the plane. Uh, we had gone straight from the uh, airport to uh, a carapita. Uh, I don't know if any of you are Venezuelan, but it's a, it's a rather dangerous district in the center of Caracas. And they wanted to film a barrio. And it was around noon on a Tuesday, which if you're going to film a barrio, isn't a bad time to do so. And we had security. But when they were coming in, and they'd been less than, in Venezuela less than two or three hours at this point, uh, we saw a government police. One of them had left an AK uh, which were one of Putin's many gifts to uh, our country, uh, that was left against a wall while somebody was tying their shoes. Some 14, 15-year-old kid from a barrio, from the, near, from the nearby barrio, grabbed the gun and started running up the uh, started running up the hills. Caracas is a valley, and the higher you get up the hills, the more the less government presence you have, the more chaotic and generally the poorer the barrios tend to be. He grabbed the gun and started running up and. One of the other uh, policemen, these were what were then PTJ, which were sort of the equivalent of FBI, uh, just grabbed their gun and just calm as you can be, shot the kid in the back. Uh, and this was in front of a metro station on a major road. Uh, and that is not usual for Venezuela, but that's the sort of perception that people have. And it's not a perception that only exists outside, it's a perception that exists inside. And people are essentially scared all the time. Uh, why hasn't the government done anything about it? Why is it that Cuba doesn't have these same problems? I think it's because Cuba is not democratic. And a lot of the control that the government has over the barrios, one of the reasons that the middle class wasn't able to stage protests in the barrios had to do not necessarily with what individuals in the barrios were feeling, but with uh, a presence of groups called colectivos. And colectivos are essentially groups that have been armed, many of them... Uh, by the government, a lot of them got weapons that were initially intended for the armed forces, uh, but you see those AKs a lot, um, that are very strongly pro-government. And I used to work in an area called Katia, uh, doing microfinance, and Katia, which is one of the tunnels you pass under uh, on your way to the airport from downtown Caracas, uh, is controlled by a very old and very, well, very feared uh, colectivo called Los Tupamaru. And they control much of what would normally be the government's responsibility in those barrios. They help uh, create uh, peace among different factions. They help with negotiations between different individuals. They do a lot of the redistributing. Uh, so they have a very strong presence. And they're armed. And they probably shouldn't be. Uh, because guns are illegal in Venezuela if you're not a government force. So... If you, as a government, try and take those guns away from groups like the Tupamaros, you're going to have probably bloodshed, but you're definitely going to lose their support. And the head of the Tupamaros came to the peace talks. <laughs> that is how influential they are within the government. Cuba doesn't have to worry about that. Cuba doesn't need to win elections. Uh, Cuba doesn't have to have these special armed forces uh, that are not government controlled because the armed forces that are government controlled do more than enough work to keep things stable and to keep things predictable. So some for this situation to change, you would need to essentially have Venezuelan security forces going up into the barrios to disarm people. Otherwise, those guns are going to stay there and those crime rates are going to stay very, very high. Uh, and while and until that happens, which no government, I mean, it would be it would be hard for an opposition government to do that, even without the political fallback. Just on the side of the bloodshed that would probably be involved in trying to do that would be a huge, huge struggle. But the government's never going to try and do that because it's lose lose for them. Uh, so instead, they'll 
they've been trying to make people feel safer by, you know, explaining, oh, dangers of perception. Uh, this is a worldwide trend towards more dangerous things. They play up a lot of the mass shootings that happen in the United States as, oh, but look, this doesn't happen here. So every country has problems. There's a lot of sort of, uh, you know, almost whimsical Panglossian explanations as to, you know, what you perceive as bad here is actually worse elsewhere. But you can't go see for yourself because flights are now five times more expensive. Uh, so I'll, I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, this issue of the militias, the, 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 the collectivos, was a topic of one of the articles we published about Venezuela recently, uh -huh. which brings me to the topic you mentioned in the, in the beginning about Latin America not being so important here in London. <laughs> it's not as relevant as you think because we okay. do have a Latin America program here. So Great. if you're interested, get in touch. Uh, thank you very much. I'm aware that we, we have to wrap it up. So thank you for coming and see you next time. Yeah, thank you.